turn it all the way up. So good evening, fellow students, and congratulations. Today, we commemorate the end of an important chapter of our lives that is not actually over yet. So I'm not really sure what to do about that, but uh, <laughs> good luck to ya. <laughs> you know, that's one of my favorite things about law school. You know, despite how many of the rules, customs, and expectations are utterly confusing and perhaps contradictory at times, you seem to be able to maintain a decent level of consensus and harmony as a group. That's not just me, right? You all don't hate each other. We're good. <laughs> In the chat. Yeah, excellent. This is great feedback. Speaking of feedback, I'll be monitoring the chat and the participants tab loosely. So feel free to share your reactions and thoughts throughout. Mm -hmm. Just note that if you select no, go faster, or take a break, I will have an emotional breakdown and I will carry that heaviness into our relationship. <laughs> Back to this whole legal profession thing. You know, I love misusing air quotes since I saw it first down on that episode of Friends with Joey, but this time I'm not using them ironically or obliviously. This evening began with an important acknowledgement of the land we're on, so I imagine that it's fitting that we invite some precision into our language when we discuss our shared experiences as students of colonial law, some of whom will be joining the colonial legal profession in a matter of a week. <laughs> I love knowing that a linguistic shift of this kind, no matter how in alignment it may be with legislation or long stated societal goals, is the perfect canvas for how rich our systems are with contradiction. Our province adopted UNDRIP last year, the United Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and Vancouver City Council endorsed in 2013 and is voting on its implementation this month. Yeah, Meanwhile, our unhoused neighbors, which are disproportionately of Indigenous ancestry, and Indigenous land offenders continue to be forcibly displaced on a daily basis through the application of colonial law. Oh, sorry. Don't say anything bad about Alex. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I know we've heard this all before. We have amazing professors who make a point of emphasizing issues of inequality, which is probably why it feels I so safe to discuss them. Korean. I once read that a culture is best illustrated through its tensions and contradictions. And that really stuck with me because I feel like the same thing can be said of humans. So how does all this beautiful dissonance play out concretely? Well, on a bad day, I feel like it might sound like, ugh, humans, they're the worst, or all men are trash. Straight people are trash. And group project free riders, straight and white people, Trump supporters, cisgender people, babies crying on airplanes, neurotypical people, the worst. People who leave the toilet seat up. People who post in our class of 2021 <laughs> Facebook about that. too often. I'm sorry. They're all <laughs> trash. Whew. Imagine carrying all of that anger. Now I know what you're thinking. Kareem, those are obviously exaggerations. How could you make light of these important issues? How? With words. What are you gonna do about it, huh? Come like talk to me about effects. it. Share your thoughts. I hope you do. I'll probably apologize. I always like to learn and grow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> On a good day, however, I like to think that making sense of all of these often converse ideas sounds more like, yes, fear and conflict are defining features of our species, but so are inherent goodwill and harmony. Now, I'm not saying that this universal goodwill is at all obvious if you Observe everyday society. You know, we read the same first year of crim law cases. That was pretty scarring. But what I'm saying is, at the outset, at birth, square one, what we'll find is fear and love. I suppose it follows that we would have created really complex systems to navigate these seemingly inherent complexities, right? Now, does that make us feel any better about having spent 26,000 hours studying rules and regulations, often at the expense of our personal relationships and mental health? Looking at the chat, yeah, I don't see any yeses. I'm seeing yeah, literally zero. <laughs> it's okay, we're here now. Back to that point about strange customs. Right? Even though we go along, we have a long way to go in terms of aligning our profession with the ideals that we carry in our hearts. The task doesn't feel so daunting to me. Why? Because I really believe in us, in our communities, and in the sustained care that we all want to bring into our work and our relationships indefinitely. Not to mention this whole alignment project doesn't really seem to be one that will ever end. So uh, buckle up. 
And I guess all we can really do is show ourselves the same compassion we want to show others and celebrate the efforts we make. Now, all of this optimism doesn't mean that I don't still struggle to know, for example, how gay or how femme I can look in court before it distracts the judge. Will their unconscious bias prejudice my client? Who benefits when I squeeze myself into a box that was not designed with me in mind and in what way? Now, I can hear at least a dozen of you in my head now reassuring me using some of my favorite phrases stolen from black culture. Girl, do not hide who you are, girl, because you are a queen. Queen. Yeah, I love that so much. You know, the first time I tried to remove every instance of appropriated black culture from my vocabulary, I really felt like nothing was left. No personality, just unoriginal phrases borrowed from a community whose oppression I benefit from. Basically just a fraud. I should be punished. Compensatory and punitive damage. What is a prostitute? Which brings us back to that <laughs> point about fear and love. Older profs look very Why confused. do we use punishment as a means of accountability? Well, probably because we fear that there will be chaos if we don't. And why do we punish ourselves when we make mistakes? Well, probably because we've been taught that punishment is the most effective too. means of behavior modification. So good. And we fear missing an opportunity to redress regrettable choices. And why? Why, why, why are we still relying on police and prisons to address social and economic issues which they are simply not equipped to solve? Well, probably because we fear that there are no suitable alternatives. I guess what I'm getting at is this. Compassion and accountability are never mutually exclusive. And punishment isn't generally that compassionate. Now, you're probably thinking about criminal law or interpersonal relationships. Yes, absolutely. Those are applying. But what about the most important relationship in your life? You know, the one that you have with yourself? If we punish ourselves for the mistakes we make, how are we supposed to have the emotional bandwidth to show compassion for the most troubled members of our community? I emphasize this point because I truly believe that letting go of those scarcity mindsets that feed systems of inequality and addressing the dire state that our profession is in, it's gonna require a lot of faith, courage, and hope. And I think that all starts with how we treat ourselves. We have inherited a pretty unwieldy and infamously unfair system. And we know that our profession is notorious for high rates of suicide and substance misuse. <laughs> what will you do in response? Cheers. Will you afford yourself the care you need to be the best version of yourself at work and at home? Or will you be like me and compulsively seek the validation of those who ask for your help until your diet only consists of bread and cheese and you fall asleep with the light on most days? I know, I know, working on it. So the pressures we face will inevitably lead into other aspects of our lives, right? We get that. And the boundaries we set, they'll be tested over and over and over again. Some days you might reminisce about the camaraderie that you shared in between the walls of the school after receiving maybe an infuriating email from opposing counsel or getting scolded at length in court. Oh, sorry. Oh, right. Yes. I should clarify by this school, I mean the Peter A. Allard School of Law. Did you all get that? Yes, that's the Peter A. Allard. A L L. Okay, you all got that? Our coping mechanisms, they'll probably vary widely from romanticizing alcoholism and making fun of your marginalized clients to joining so many CBA committees that one's life becomes one long Zoom meeting with pee breaks. And we will make mistakes yeah. that cause other material suffering like Professor Stacy mentioned. But let's not forget how rewarding other days will be too. You know what, what, what Maybe a doing? client or a colleague will tell you how much of a difference you made in their life through what you did. Or maybe you'll learn that your submissions to government were impactful and that they chose to decriminalize sex work or simple possession as a result. And other days, again, maybe you'll remember feeling victimized after you were found eating in the library and you'll mm -hmm. wish you were back in that same place for some weird reason, mm -hmm. probably because you didn't have a job, but you also didn't have so much responsibility. Now that's a lot of ways to carry. I'm really selling this, aren't I? Are we all looking forward to what's before us? <laughs> I want to leave you all with one of my favorite quotes, which I feel is not only very applicable to this shared experience we have to write together right now, but which can also serve as a guiding force when we lose our sense of control or when we disconnect from the people in our lives that matter the most. 
It's a quote by Thomas Merton, and it goes like this. You do not need to know precisely what is happening or exactly where it's all going. What you need is to recognize the possibilities and challenges offered by the present moment and to embrace them with faith, courage, and hope. End quote. Sometimes doing what you know to be right will take a lot of courage. It might mean sticking your neck out when others haven't so that those that come after you have it better or asking for help, saying no, being open about your pain, making sure you're letting yourself cry when you need to, admitting that you're scared as about disappointing others, or confessing that some of us, like me, lack inherent self-worth, and so instead we rely on our work or our relationships to find some sort of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. These are truly courageous acts, and there's no question that faith and hope will be essential to your commitment to seizing those difficult but precious opportunities to right, grow right. and do well by your community. Oh I God, feel so, right. so lucky to call you my classmates, and I can't wait to see what lies ahead for us all. Please be generous with yourselves, be curious, keep an open heart, and keep in touch. Sending you all lots of love from my subpar home office. <laughs> Let's unmute and say clap.